while Tina Brown has been described as a red Porsche and a gold dust fairy, she considers herself a magazine romantic. At just 25 years old, she was editor-in-chief with the UK's Tatler magazine before she crossed the pond to revive Vanity Fair in America. She shares those early days, missing England, and the iconic magazine cover of a very pregnant Demi Moore in her new book, Vanity Fair Diaries, 1983-1992. And we're pleased that it brings her to our studio tonight. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, so people keep journals uh, for themselves, assumingly. Now your diaries are being shared with the masses. Why do that? It's interesting. I mean, when I wrote these diaries, they just came tumbling out of me in this sort of need to unload the new world I was suddenly plunged into, having come from London. It was really me talking to my inner self, in a sense, just to make things clear to myself. Now, when I read them, I realize that they're so much a, a journal of becoming. You know, they're, they're a story of, a, of who I was when I first came to America, my hopes and dreams, and my lack of knowledge, really, of the place and, and any of it, and my sense of learning and how it, how it affected me at the time, and the detail of it in the end is what made me feel I wanted to publish these as diaries. Because if you wrote a memoir as such, you know, you excise things and you have to sort of condense. And it was something about the daily detail that made them, I felt, much more compelling to read as diaries. Did you have any anxiety about sharing certain parts of your life? Well, I did a sort of very close edit of the diaries. I mean, but what I actually mainly edited out was the sort of whingy, self-communion that you do in a diary when you sort of, you just, you often whinge in a diary, right? I mean, you sort of worry and niggle at things that aren't that interesting to everybody else. So I had a sort of criterion. It was like, is this uh, very funny? You know, is this a, a candid something that I doubt to share, which probably means it's interesting? You know, are the characters I'm writing about compelling enough? I had these sort of, you know, and I, I kept doing rounds of editing. So in the end, it became something that I felt was really only meeting that high bar of what a reader wanted, mm -hmm. right? I mean, nobody wants to read the inner ruminations of somebody who's, you know, some egomaniacal sort of worries. They don't like that. But what they want to hear is, like, how did this person, you know, adjust and become something? And who did she meet and who did she know and what happened? I mean, you met a lot of people <laughs> who are very famous, very powerful. Looking back, though, in the diaries, are you, were, you, were you, I don't know, I guess, worried about what some of them might say about how they were portrayed in the diaries? Well, I did worry about some of them because, uh, you know, sometimes people don't know what you're thinking, right, when you're thinking it. And there have been a couple of people who said, you know, I had no idea that's how you felt about, you know, my dad or whatever. And I mean, and it's difficult sometimes uh, to decide, well, this may not cause um, happiness in the person who's reading it. But again, I made very, very sort of detailed judgments about, is this really a necessary part of my story? And I, I felt a bit past that test, and I, I had to share it. And I get the sense that being honest and truthful is very important to you. As a writing voice, I, I wanted to be authentic. You know, I don't think there's any point in writing about your own life unless you're real, truthful, candid, and talk about your insecurities, which of which there is a lot in, in, in the book. Talk about uh, your doubts and your self-doubts, because it's boring to hear read about somebody who just kind of sailed through and, and never had a doubt. I mean, that just wouldn't be real, and it wouldn't be true. All of us are racked by insecurities. It's just a question of, are we willing to admit it? And it's such a relief to be yourself. You know, there is a kind of wonderful relaxation, in a sense, about just admitting everything about yourself. And if people don't like it, well, you know what? Hasta la vista. <laughs> well, you tell this really great story at the beginning of the diaries about your parents. Um, when you were a teen, you were kicked out of several schools mm -hmm. and your dad and mom went to pick you up at one of these schools and your dad said to the headmaster or headmistress, and you know, I feel very sad for you that you don't get this unusual girl. <laughs> um, is your foundation for uh, being confident from your parents? Well, I did feel completely um, wrapped in my parents' sort of love and approval, I suppose. You know, I mean, I you know, my, my parents just always had my back, if you like. And I mean, it didn't mean they didn't give me hell, or when I got home, they didn't give me, you know, a real dressing down. But certainly, when it came to me versus the world, they always had my back, you know, they, they were there for me. And my father, you know, he was a movie producer, and he understood uh, how exposed, in a way, people of a creative temperament are. You know, he understood my own sensitivities, I think, and how 
I was a very creative, unusual kid. I mean, because I was, I, I was very uh, questioning of authority always in a way that was sort of ahead of my years. And, and frankly, I mean, half the time he felt, and my mother felt, I was right. I mean, these ridiculous, you know, posh boarding schools with their silly rules and their kind of ridiculous. I think one of them you got into trouble because they wanted you to wear two <laughs> pairs of knickers, and you That's said That's exactly no. right. No, I led a demonstration across the lacrosse pitch <laughs> because we were made to wear two pairs of underwear in, the, in at boarding school and you could only allow to change the outer underwear three times a week. And so I didn't like that. I thought it was ridiculous. So I led a demonstration across the lacrosse pitch saying, knickers out, 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 knickers in, in, in. Except unfortunately it was me that was out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time that I was kicked out. It was like, just get her out of here. Just get her out. <laughs> well, eventually, we, are we are over her. <laughs> well, eventually you leave the UK and you move to uh, America and your diary entries begin on April 10th, 1983 with you coming to meet uh, Cy Newhouse, the legendary head of Condé Nast Publishing. Why would he want to meet you? Well, he had already bought the Tatler magazine, which was my first uh, journalistic effort. At just I, 25? At just 25. I, I mean, the Tatler at that time was this little tiny shiny sheet. And a, an Australian real estate tycoon had come into London and thought, I want to be a publisher, as, as people do. And so he bought this, this title, The Tatler, and he decided he wanted to make it into a real glossy magazine like Vogue. And he tried to hit, hire an editor. And I was a young writing journalist just out of Oxford. And I think he, he approached every editor in you know, London to do this thing. And everybody laughed and said they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. But I had become desirous of having my own sort of little platform because I already felt that I would rather be the person deciding what other people wrote than having to sort of sell my writing to other people. I had a strong sense of what I thought was interesting. And so when he started to look around for a young editor, somebody recommended he meet me, although I actually had never edited anything, but I was beginning to make a reputation as a writer. And uh, as soon as I, I saw immediately it would be a great opportunity, I thought, you know, it's a failing thing, but it would be my thing, be my show. I read where, somewhere that um, you had been assigned to be a go-go dancer, <laughs> and that's when you that, said enough. That was the moment when I was writing a <laughs> column for the humor magazine Punch, and I was asked to go and, and tell, tell you know, the readers what it was like to be a go-go dancer and dance on a, on a you know, in a, in a go-go dancing uh, bar. Which I did, gain, gainfully, I have to say. Well, we shared that in common. I was a go-go dancer for a little bit in university <laughs> to pay the bills. Well, um, <laughs> we'll have to share what it's like backstage. <laughs> but when you have this meeting, um, you essentially get um, uh, this job offer, but then you get back on the plane and you go back to England. That's right. Well, what happened at first was that Newhouse at Condé Nast had bought Tatler, asked to meet me. I came in to meet with him. And he said, I said, I'd be a consultant because my whole family was in London and I didn't, you know, I was based in London. And so he had me come as a consultant. And it was in a few weeks I realized that they just had no clue how to do it. And so he began to realize that I was the right person. And so he offered the job to me. But I didn't want to do anything except the editor in chief because he wanted me to come in and sort of be the number two and say, you know, and sort of be the, the kind of real editor while someone else was being the editor over me. And I just jumped on a plane and went home, which was quite kind of cocky of me because I basically thought, unless I'm going to be the editor, I don't want the job at all. So I went back to London and I sat there. And for a while, I, I, I started to think, my God, I've blown it. You know, I've just been too cocky by half. But sure enough, after a few months, the editor they, they had failed, the second editor, and they called me and said, would I come for an interview? And I knew that I was coming in this time to be offered the job as editor of Vanity Fair. What was that day like when you walked down the hallway to your office as editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair? Well, you know, it was, it was really surreal because I had, you know, I'd been there as a consultant, so I'd got to know all the people, which was a bit like being at summer school before the real school, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had watched and noticed all these people and I knew who, who I thought was good and who wasn't. But I also couldn't believe that I was walking through this office to this, the office at the end and that was gonna be my office of editor-in-chief. And I was mostly much younger than everybody there. You were 29 at the time, I right? was 29, and I really didn't know anybody in America at all. I mean, I'd been a couple of times on vacation, uh, lived there for a month or two. And you wrote a play about that And I wrote experience. a play about that experience when I was just out of Oxford. But, you know, I, don't, I was there, I think, for six weeks. And um, so I, I, I felt, in some ways, trepidation, but in other ways, I was tremendously confident because I knew how to, what I was going to do. I knew that this magazine could be absolutely changed top to toe. And I knew how to go, go about doing it because I had done that at Tatler where I'd been a great success. But it was rocky. There was a lot of office politics. There was. Well, of course, there was a lot of resentment because mm -hmm. here I was, this British editor who walked in. They'd seen me in the summer, but, you know, who, why was I suddenly there? 
And, uh, of course, there'd been two staffs already hired by the two preceding editors, all of whom disliked each other, and now they dislike me. So I had to win them and bring in my own team, but I had to do it all at warp speed. And what I realized was, first of all, I had to redesign the magazine top to toe. So over the first weekend in January, because you know, it was snowing, it was, um, you know, I was living in a hotel, but we came in over the weekend and I said, okay, we're gonna redesign this magazine top to toe because it was a sort of mess visually, you know? So I decided I wanted a strong, clear, classical layout. And I, I, I stood in the art department with the art director and we just redesigned it top front to back, you know. Uh, uh, the fonts, everything. Everything, new typefaces, mm -hmm. new everything. And it, it has sort of stayed the same really for since, since we did it that weekend, it's amazing. Because you were going for a classic look. I was going for a classic, strong look, mm -hmm. you know, very classical typefaces clean you know projection of the photography and i remember thinking that i had to put out an issue very quickly because i came in january the first issue was april which for a monthly means you've got you know a few weeks and i was ransacking the drawers of the art department saying you know there's got to be something in here that's you know where's the inventory let's look what do we got and i opened a drawer and there were these amazing photographs sitting there and they were by annie Leibovitz. they were photographs of comedians that she'd taken one of which was that what became a very famous picture of Whoopi Goldberg in a, in, in, a bath of, in a bathtub of milk. And I looked at these pictures and I said, these are unbelievable. Why, what are they doing here? And they said, well, you know, the other editor didn't like them. I said, well, that's ridiculous. This is incredible. I said, let's make a portfolio of them and call them April Fools. And we'll do this, this Annie uh, splash. Mm -hmm. So we threw that into the magazine. And then it was Oscars coming up because at that time, Oscars were in, uh, uh, at that time of the year. And uh, we decided to do Blonde Ambition. I said, we've got to change these horrible covers, which Vanity Fair was doing, which they, they were using black and white photographs of writers on the cover of Vanity Fair. Uh, a famous one, uh, particularly, was of, of, of Philip Roth with what looked like his finger up his nose. It was just the worst thing, kind of close up of, you know. Uh, and my feeling is a great writer should be read but not seen on the cover of magazines, right? But Daryl Hannah should be yeah, seen. Exactly. I mean, let's put a writer's inside <laughs> and the movie stars on the cover. So I commissioned this other portfolio from the great photographer Helmut Newton, which I wanted to call Blonde Ambition. And we photographed all the new kind of actresses in Hollywood who, who had caught everybody's eye and I put Daryl Hannah on the cover blindfolded holding the Oscars kind of like and the scale like a scale scales of justice I felt but I also noticed it could also mean you said blonde ambition could that also be referring to your yes ambition? I hope this cover was rich in <laughs> subtext right it was blonde ambition which was a double entendre with me uh -huh. and there was the scales she was the scales of justice blind justice but you know it was also the fate of the magazine in the balance and they were that she, she was carrying out Oscar statuettes and the great thing was that at that time she was an unknown starlet, but as we published, she came out in Splash, mm -hmm. which was at that time her big, huge debut hit. And so we had the right blonde on the cover, which was sort of the way Vanity Fair went from then on. There was a lot of buzz about the first issue, your first issue. How was it received? Well, everybody loved my new discovery. His name was Dominic Dunn. He wrote the piece on Blonde Ambition, and he was, a, 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 at that time, he'd been an, a, a failing film producer, and I had met him at a dinner party uh, of a friend, and he was so entertaining, so interesting. And he had lots of, he had tragedy in his and, life. And he had this tragedy whereby mm -hmm. he told me that his daughter had been murdered, and he was going out to uh, LA for her murderer's trial. And I told him, I said to him, you know, you have such a voice for story and have gone through such tragedy, you should keep a diary, and maybe it would be something that you could publish. Being a diarist myself, of course, I was always feeling that diaries were the way to kind of learn what you knew and thought. And he did, and he kept that diary, and he came in with a piece which uh, was called Justice, which was probably one of the most best pieces Vanity Fair ever published. It was so moving about this trial and about his fury at the jury having given too lenient a sentence, as he believed, mm -hmm. to his daughter's murderer. And that was really the start. I, I, he was my first hire. And because you nurtured a lot of uh, young writers along the way. I did. I found many, many writers. What were you looking for when you... Well, what I always look for is, is voice, you know? Voice is what I listen, what look for. And the other thing I, I have learned is that you can teach a writer uh, to how to write a lead, but you can't teach a writer how to notice the right things. So if I'm talking to somebody and I'm seeing that they are telling me a story and I'm noticing things, then I know that that person might be able to do that on the page. 
because otherwise, you know, you haven't got the basic things you need to be a writer. Editorial is one aspect of what you were doing, but you also had to get advertising on board. Mm -hmm. And you were courting a lot of people. Please dish on the names. <laughs> Oh, we were caught. I mean, I, I had to get all of these fashion guys. They were the main people I had to get in. I had to get Calvin Klein, uh, Ralph Lauren, and at the time, Perry Ellis, who, who died later. But, and they all sort of competed against each other. And it was all about courting them, constantly courting them, and trying to make them understand what I was doing. And, you know, at first, for a long time, Vanity Fair was not understood by the advertisers. You know, they would, they would turn through it, and I used to dread it. You know, they would go through it, and they'd go, hmm, hmm, hmm. hmm. Well, what is it? You know, I mean, is, is it a fashion magazine? Is it a film magazine? Is it a, a, you know, some kind of a political magazine? I've got, you know, politics is in here, you know. And I kept trying to make them understand this is a magazine literally as a store. You know, it is, it is a magazine that is a, uh, a, a, a sort of uh, cutting edge of the, of, of the sort of front lines of the whole culture, you know, curated together. But, you know, try saying that in a short way. I mean, I can't even do it today. I never could figure out, you know, what, how, to, how to say to them, this is about sensibility on the page. You know, this is about giving you a, a sort of banquet of the culture at warp speed, which is what we all want for a magazine. But it was very difficult, and it was really only the readers who, who loved it, you know, who after a time, and it took a while, but a year and a half after I came in and remade the magazine, because it was failing when I took it on. And... Cy Newhouse and Condé Nast, you know, they weren't prepared to lose money forever. So it was about how fast I could turn this thing around. And in fact, in June 1985, Cy Newhouse very nearly closed it. And I learned it because I found that eight, the uh, human resources had stopped allowing us to hire anybody. And you know what that means? It means mm -hmm. that, you know, nobody's getting hired and why is that, right? I learned that he was actually going to close it. And I flew back from San Francisco where I was trying to sell advertising, as <laughs> usual. And, uh, you turned it around. Yeah, I, I persuaded him. I, mm. I, I got into his face and, and, and said to him, you know, you've got to give us, give me, give me six months. You just give me, give me the time to get these stories that are in the works out. One of which was Dominic Dunn's incredible story about the Klaus von Mueller murder trial that was in the middle of happening. Another of which was uh, my own story I wrote about Princess Diana. Oh, uh, I want to. I yeah. want to talk I mean, more so, about and, that. And, you know, yeah. we, I said to him, "We have these incredible stories. You've got to let us get them out." And he said, "Okay, I'll give you a two years." Which really meant a few months. And he always <laughs> said two years, and he always meant six months. Six and, months. And I knew. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about the covers because the covers were very important in selling the magazine. Um, the one we have right now is Joan Collins, December nineteen eighty-three, with the tag "She Rhymes with Rich." <laughs> How did that come about? Well, you know, Dynasty at the time was the, the sort of the hot show. I mean, and Dynasty, to me, just defined that era. And I wanted Joan Collins on the cover because I just thought it's, it's this crazy era of big hair, you know, big money, big noise, big cars. It was, it was you know, She Rhymes With Rich. She Rhymes With Rich actually is uh, something that um, Barbara Bush said about the uh, Democratic um, vice presidential candidate uh, Geraldine Ferraro. It became a kind of catchphrase. It was a very catty thing of her to say. And our joke was just, you know, Joan is the sort of the ultimate... You know, she, she played, you know, the bitchy, you know, rich Dallas woman. Mm. And, um, you know, we were making a statement, really, about the 80s. And a big statement was having the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, on the cover with his wife, Nancy. Um, this was a, there's a great story behind this. Mm -hmm. Well, this was one of the, this was really the cover that I think probably most made the statement that we were going to live, mm -hmm. you know, because... It really helped to turn the whole fortunes of the magazine around because this, this came out in the summer of 1985, just when Cy Newhouse was thinking about closing us. And this really stopped that happening. What happened was is that we got access to the White House to do a photo shoot on the Reagans, Mr. and Mrs. Reagan, together um, with Harry Benson, who was a, a photographer who'd shot many presidents in the past and I knew could do it, right? And... The idea was to do something about their relationship because it seemed to me that the interesting story about the Reagan era really was them, was the two of them, not just him, but their relationship and how that relationship uh, seemed to kind of epitomize what America wanted to see in terms of this bond, glamour, stability, love. You know, it was a kind of incredible positive imagery of the Reagans together that people found so appealing. So I wanted to do this cover and make that statement. 
And uh, it sold a lot of copies. It sold a lot of copies, yeah. mainly because Harry Benson, who's a genius, decided that he was going to take a boom box with Which him, he pulled out of his bag. Which he pulled out of his bag <laughs> with tapes of Frank Sinatra, uh -huh. uh, one song of which was Nancy's favorite, Nancy with the Laughing Face. And as the Reagans came in, they were mm -hmm. on their way to a black tie state dinner. So they were dressed. For the president of Argentina. Mm -hmm. So they were dressed in full black tie. Um, Harry hits the boom box and Frank Sinatra starts to croon. And the president says something like, you Nancy, don't want to keep the president well, waiting. That's right. Right? Nancy looks at Ronnie and says, yeah. Ronnie, that's our, our song. And, and Ronnie says, uh, we can't keep the president of Argentina waiting, Nancy. And she said, oh, let's dance. And the two of them start Pictures. doing this foxtrot together <laughs> as if there's no one else there but them. They're looking at each other. They're in their own movie completely. And Harry Benson is leaping up and down, taking pictures, you know, snapping it all. And, the, and, and then Harry, who's very Scottish, goes, Mr. President, Mr. President, give your wife a kiss. And Picture. he leans forward, click, click, click. Uh -huh. And I'm standing there thinking, yes. we have <laughs> an amazing cover. You mentioned Diana, because we're running out of time. You mentioned Princess Diana and the cover that you did with her. Um, you tagged it, the mouse that roared. When that cover came out, the story itself, you said some things, um, that the press in the UK turned around you and attacked your marriage in a sense. <laughs> How did you receive that? Well, actually, I was very entertained by the whole thing because the British press in their typical tabloid fashion, they ripped off everything I said in the, in the piece, but then, you know, pretended they were outraged that a so-called American journalist, as they now call me, had done this. Uh, very disrespectful cover, they said, about the fact that the Wales' marriage, Charles and Diana's marriage, was actually not everything it seemed. I mean, guess what? We all know now, of course, that was totally true. But at the time, I was the first person to break that news, that the, the Charles and Diana marriage was in serious trouble. So the way they wrote about me was to take my marriage and, 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 and parody our marriage as if it was exactly like this one. They called me the Joan Crawford of publishing, and they, uh, 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 who, who turned into this crazy diva which was very funny. And actually, I framed it and put it into the, in the bathroom. So you weren't insulted <laughs> at all? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the magazine that people have copied since is the Demi Moore cover. Um, yes. Annie did this one, right? Annie Leibovitz, another genius cover from Annie. Yeah, this came about really because I had just given birth to my second child and had been feeling very sort of mutinous, if you like, about wearing maternity clothes, as we then did. I don't think maternity clothes even exist anymore, actually, but we used to buy these big dresses and all the rest of it. And I was feeling really, you know, I'd got through this with a kind of grit, grin and bear it uh, second child experience. And so we got this permission to go and photograph uh, Demi Moore. And I said to Annie, why don't you, when she was pregnant, and I said to Anna, Annie, why don't you show her stomach, meaning, in a tight dress, right? Because it was usually at that time, if you were pregnant, you know, a star, you would sort of cut it here. So Annie said, that sounds good. So she went off and she did the picture mm -hmm. and she came back and she brought back beautiful pictures of Demi wearing a beautiful tight dress with her bulge showing. And I said, these are fabulous. And Annie said, well, there is this other, other picture I took that uh, was really for Bruce uh, Willis and Demi, you know, they're married. She said, I, it sort of did this as a private picture, but why don't you look at it? And I looked at it and I said, we've got to do this cover. We have to do this cover. And the response was great. A lot oh of people wrote in. And a Annie, lot of, of women persuaded wrote. Demi to do it. Kudos yeah. to Demi that she agreed. Well, we, first of all, Walmart refused to carry it. And we had to shrink wrap it like a porn magazine, which made it even more, uh, of course, uh, sort of hot in contrabrand. Mm -hmm. And I thought we were going to get a little bit of, you know, discussion. But I never thought it would turn into what it did, which was this massive sensation. I mean, the Demi Moore cover has been reproduced, I think, I would, I would probably suggest more than any other cover I've ever seen. I mean, in the sense it still gets reproduced. Mm -hmm. And the incredible thing is, is that now so many stars have copied it. I mean, last summer even, uh, Serena Williams suddenly does her, her Demi version. Moore cover. It's like, it's yeah. a rite of passage now for pregnant female superstars to want to do their, quote, Demi Moore shot, and Annie's done many since. You write about, uh, in their diaries, you write about the stock market crash. You were spending time with princesses, countesses, actors, musicians, very, very wealthy people. What signs did you see that all was not right in New York City? Well, I mean, actually, in, in the Vanity Fair diaries, there is a very sort of, there's always a dark strand, actually. And the dark strands are my sense that how precarious all of this is, this crazy, this boom, boom, boom of the Reagan era 
the uh, animal spirits on Wall Street, the, the, the sort of acquisitive thrill of, the, of, of mergers and acquisitions and a sense that the world was spinning faster and faster. And I kept feeling, and you know, many an entry is talking about how disparate and how I don't like the, 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 the rising inequality that I'm seeing, that I'm feeling that it's either the limo or the, or, or the sidewalk of the homeless, you know, that it's a kind of, there's nothing in between. But even you, you're, you and your husband, uh, Harry Evans, you made more money in the States than you did in England, and you mentioned that in the diary, but you worried about money a lot. Yeah, Why? I did. It's funny, I mean, I, I talk about having, about realizing that, you know, we were paid much less in England, in London, and yet we never talked about money. You know, we never really felt the pressure of money. Mm -hmm. When, as soon as we came to New York, you suddenly realize that you're on this kind of, the, the acquisitive uh, uh, pressure in, in New York, the materialism of it was very much, you know, in my face all the time. I mean, the people were just spending these insane sums and there was this competitive sense of, of, of materialism at all times, which I often find in, in the book you read, you know, how sort of insecure making it was very often just to have this constant sort of pressure of everybody spending and a sense that, you know, there was this all, you never had enough. And, um, my own values obviously were very much more about family and about my husband and being with my kids. And I, I always saw all of this going out that I did as a way to get stories. To me, this was about, um, you know, digging into the culture, learning, the, learning what was going on and covering it as an editor. But I didn't want to be there as a guest particularly. I wanted to be there as the editor looking for stories. And that's always been true of me actually. Well, it's been really great talking to you, Tina. Thank We're you. run out of time, but we'll continue our conversation Thank in you. the next yeah. show. Thank, Thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.